tonight because I learned faith from what uh, Ben Fitzgerald was talking about, a praying mother. One night, I was in my room, and we were in the middle of a situation about to be evicted. A lot of you know my story. I've been homeless before, but we were about to be evicted, and I heard my mom crying in the middle of the night, and I wondered what was up, so I got up out of my bed, and I, I went over to her room, and I thought she was you know, going through something, something was wrong. And so the door was cracked and I pushed it open just to see what was wrong with mom. And the crying that I heard wasn't the kind of crying that I thought it was. She was kneeling next to the bed, thanking God for his faithfulness. Even though she may not see the situation changing, she was declaring, God, you're still good. And I thank you for what we do have. We may not have all that we've been asking for, but we thank you that we have everything that we need because we have you, Jesus. All right, good morning, Crossover family, and happy Mother's Day to all those to, to whom that applies. We welcome you. Say hello, everybody, this year. For some reason today, we are mostly on this side, so I'm going to be kind of going more this direction. So uh, bless you guys. We're so glad you're here with us today. And again, I hope all you mothers have already started the, getting pampered some today. I know the pampering was going on at my household, uh, at least I can speak for my own. Uh, so bless you, mothers. Hope you have a great time with your families today. And we as a family, the church family today, are going to have a great time in the Lord. Amen? Do you mind just uh, agreeing with me? You guys mind standing, please, that are here? And uh, if you want, even if you want to uh, reach out, extend your hand towards me, I'm going to open up in prayer. I hope that you came in to the house of the, of the Lord. I hope that you tuned in today expecting an encounter from God. I believe that he wants to have an encounter with us. Amen? Let's pray. Agree with me, please. Father, we praise you today. You have blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Lord, we choose today to agree with you, Lord, in who we are in you. You chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in your sight. We praise you for that, Lord, because of your amazing agape love you predestined us to be your children through your Son in accordance with your pleasure and will. We thank you that you that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of your grace, this grace that you have lavished on us, and we praise you for that grace today. I pray, Father, that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which you have called us the riches of your glorious inheritance in your holy people, and that we would know your incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength you exerted when you raised Christ from the dead. And Lord, today we also thank you, Lord, for the mothers that are here today and the mothers that are watching from home. We ask you to pour out a special blessing on them. And as we praise your name in this place today, let your power fall. Meet us here today, Lord, we pray. We welcome you, Lord. Amen. You heal the brokenhearted. You set the captive free. You lift the heavy burden. And even now you are lifting me. There is no healer like the Lord our Maker. There is no equal to the King of Kings. Our God is with us, we will fear no evil. Cause you do impossible things. Cause you do impossible things. Yes, you do.
Though I walk through the valley Darkness surrounding me There you prepare a table Well, in the presence of my enemies There is no healer like the Lord our Maker There is no equal to the King of Kings Our God is with us, we will fear no evil Cause you do impossible things Cause you do the impossible possible For one word and the walls start falling the one word and the blind will see the one word and the sin is forgiven cause you do impossible things the one word and the walls start falling the one word and the blind will see the one word and the sin is forgiven cause you do impossible things there is no healer like the Lord our Maker. There is no equal to the King of Kings. Our God is with us, we will fear no evil. Cause you do impossible things. There is no healer like the Lord our Maker. There is no equal to the King of Kings. Our God is with us, we will fear no evil. Cause you do impossible things Cause you do impossible things Cause you do impossible things Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord. You do the impossible, Lord God. And Father, we thank you. Just as Jeremiah, when you came to the prophet Jeremiah, and you said, is there anything too difficult for me? And he responded, ah, oh, Lord God, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power. Nothing is too difficult for you, Lord. Father, we come to the, the God who works the impossible, who does the impossible this morning. And we cry out to you for breakout and breakthrough, Lord. Father, we are trusting in you, God. We are in desperate need of breakthrough in our lives, in our homes, in our families, in our community, in our state, Lord God, in our nation, the nations of the world, Father. Lord, we are not irrelevant. We are not cast aside. We may be pressed down. We may be crushed. We may be uh, persecuted, Lord, but we are not forsaken. You are with us, O oh God. You have called us by your glory and goodness. You do impossible things, and our eyes are on you this morning. And we are lifting up our brothers and sisters today who are in need of breakthrough, who are in need of provision, who are in need of open doors, who are in need, oh God, of freedom. And we thank you, Father God, that you are a work in our midst, Father, and we are trusting in you. In Jesus' name. Savior, number. 
name above all names. Your name is Jesus, risen from the dead. You are the glory, lifter of our heads. You have the only name by which we can be saved. I call you Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. I call you Jesus. stronger than you. No name is higher than the name of Jesus. Nobody bigger than you. No one can do what you do. No name is higher than the name of higher than the name of Jesus. Your name is Jesus risen from the you healer this morning. Lord, we call you deliverer. We call you Lord. Father, we declare this morning that you are our refuge. You are our fortress, our God in whom we trust, Lord. Father, we thank you that you say of us, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. And we acknowledge you this morning, O oh God. We trust in you with our hearts today. Lord, you said that we would call on you and that you would answer us, Lord, when we cry out to you in our distress, when we cry out to you in our suffering, when we cry out to you in our weakness, when we cry out to you when sickness is in our bodies, Father God. Lord, we call upon the name of Jesus this morning. You have promised to be with us in trouble, God. You have promised to deliver us and honor us and with long life to satisfy us, oh God, and to show us your salvation. So we thank you for that this morning. And Father, we want to lift up uh, the Brant family this morning. And Lord God, we want to lift up Irene and Clayton and all of the Brant family as they mourn the loss of Steve, oh God. And we thank you, Lord, that you are with them to comfort and strengthen them. Father God, we want to lift up Vicki and her family as they mourn the loss of their grandmother this morning, God. We thank you for the godly lives, the legacies that have been passed on to their families. And we thank you for your comfort, Lord. And Father, we just continue to bless all of those who are suffering this morning, all of those in need of healing this morning. We continue to declare that you have called yourself healer. You said, I am the God who heals you and we thank you for that this morning in Jesus name hallelujah thank you Lord walking around these walls I fought by now before 
but you have never failed me yet. Oh, waiting for change to come, knowing the battle's won, for you have never failed. Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness, I'm still in your hands, this is my confidence, you've never failed me in this nation from its very birth of America throughout, oh God, the decades. Lord, you have been so faithful to pour out your spirit upon your people. 
And Lord, we call out to you as Hezekiah prayed. And we declare that you are the God who sits enthroned in our praises this morning, that sits enthroned between the cherubim this morning. We declare that you alone are God, that you are the kingdoms of all of the earth, Lord. And you have made heaven and earth. And we are asking you, God, give ear to our cry. Open your eyes and see. Listen, O oh God, to all of the words that are being spoken against you, spoken against what is right, spoken against what is just, spoken against love, spoken against the way you created things to be. But Father, we declare that you are God this morning. And we offer ourselves up to you, Lord. And we are asking that you move within us. Do it again, God. Move within us, Father. Set the fire in our hearts again, Lord. Father, pour out your spirit upon us again, oh God. Do it again. Do it again. We need a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And we thank you, Father, that we are your children and that you are with us and you are a gracious Father who gives the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. And we thank you, Father. We are asking this morning to be baptized fresh and anew with the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And Father God, we want to lift up this prayer request that came in for this precious one who got bit by a dog in her face, Lord, and had to have stitches and Lord, we just pray your blessing upon this precious one, God. We pray for healing of her face, Lord. That God, that she would be comforted and know that you are with her. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You move, you move the mountains, and I believe. And I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe. I see you do it again. I've seen you move. Come on. You move the mountains, and I believe. Yes. I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe. I see you do it again. I've seen you move. You move the mountains, and I believe. I see you do it again. You made a way. Where well, there was no way, and I believe I see you do it again. Hallelujah, Lord, you will do it again. Amen, amen. Hey, why are you up so late, sweetie? Sorry, Dad, got a lot of work to do here. Do you have any idea how many things Mom does when nobody sees? No, but... I bet you're about to tell me. There are fairies who follow moms around everywhere they go. I was not aware of this. They keep track of all the things moms do. The things we see and we don't see. And wouldn't you believe it? The fairies kind of look like Uncle Bob. Really? <laughs> I don't mean to typecast, but Bob, you don't strike me as fairy material. Come sit, and I'll tell you all about it. Great. I want to hear more about Bob the Fairy. Once upon a time, there was a fairy named Bob. But he had much cooler ears than Uncle Bob. How much cooler? Trust me, I'm a fairy expert. <laughs> I'm going to like this story. Oh, I bet you are. Watch out, glitter bubbles and little pink wings. That's a great idea. <laughs> you see, Bob the Fairy sees when Mom goes to the 24-hour store. When someone forgets to mention, she needs a costume made for the school play the next morning. And that someone's me. Speaking of costumes, I think Bob needs a tutu. 
Come on! When no one is looking, Mom makes super special birthday cakes. I bet that icing's gonna give Bob a sugar crash. <laughs> okay, my turn. Did you know that Mom takes care of you even when she's sick? <laughs> Mom sure is brave. Yeah. And when you forget your lunch, she even yep. goes back to get it when she's running late. And at the end of the day, moms do some of their best work when no one is around to watch them. You know what? God sure blessed you when he gave you your mommy. Yes, he did, Dad. Now keep writing. We have a lot of work to do. see you. It's good to be here with you guys today. Hi, Carolyn. Good to see you, sister. It seems like every week we see some people we haven't seen in a while. That's awesome. Um, let's open up our usual way, please. Uh, if you look at the screen, repeat after me. I open my heart to receive from the Word of God. God's promises are true, and they are true for me. So indeed, Happy Mother's Day to everybody. Hope you are enjoying your beautiful day here that God's created. It's, it's a nice day outside. Great day for Mother's Day, right? Um, if you look at this card, I don't know if you can read that writing on the bottom. It's a quote from Abraham Lincoln. It says, all that I am or hope to ever be, I owe to my angel mother. <laughs> so that's a good quote. Mother's Day. It was, did you know that Mother's Day was first observed uh, in the nation on May 9th, just like today? In 1914, a long time ago, it was an act of Congress. President Woodrow Wilson proclaimed the second Sunday in May as Mother's Day. He established the day as a time for public expression for our love and reverence for mothers and our country. Mothers work hard, there's no doubt about that, but sometimes they don't display the best math skills. Let me tell you what I mean by that. She spends 50% of her energy on her daily tasks 50% of her time on her husband, and 50% on her children. <laughs> you see the dilemma. Some of you right now are going, wait a minute, 50, 50? I didn't know there's going to be math today. Point is, is that the importance of a mother's love is undeniable. I plan on talking about today the intentionality of motherhood. Everything, this is a theme that I have been saying over the last year, especially during this pandemic, is the intentionality of God's word, the intentionality of what God does. Today, I want to talk about the intentionality of motherhood. I mean, the importance of motherhood, the importance of a mother's love. It, it heals 
boo-boos, right? <laughs> it comforts hurt feelings and life's disappointments and it encourages her child to strive for all they can be. I believe there are a few things in the world that resembles God's unconditional love. But one of them surely is a mother's love. There are also few things in the world as beautiful as the sight of a mother who lets God's love flow through her to her children, blessing them with tenderness. This love is extremely important to a child, especially in the early developing years. It's common for believers that struggle with accepting love and grasping God's love. It's, it's common to find out that maybe their childhood wasn't ideal and maybe they weren't, maybe they didn't experience that love when they were young and formidable. And maybe they didn't experience a mother's love. And here's a statement that kind of goes along with what I said a minute ago. It just kind of goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. God created motherhood. Well, duh, he created everything, right? But he created motherhood intentionally. But what is motherhood and why motherhood? You ever wonder that? Is, and what I mean by that is, is motherhood solely about childbearing? If so, it just occurred to me that God could have done that any way that he wanted to, right? I mean, look at the animal kingdom. The, you know, the animals give birth and oftentimes go off and leave their young to fend for themselves. Either last year or the year before, I can't remember, I gave some statistics about different animals that actually are less than nurturing, let's just say, uh, to their babies. You know, they basically kick them out of the nest and sometimes they even eat their babies, <laughs> I mean, what is it that sets mankind apart? Is, again, is motherhood solely about childbearing? I just think that God could have done it any way that he wanted to. So, to, so indeed, today, I want to ask, tackle this question. Why did God create motherhood? I think you might be encouraged by the grace and the answer that we're going to come up with today. I took a trip all the way back to the Genesis story, to the beginning, the creation story, and I saw a few things that I'd never noticed before. I thought we could just take a little journey today, and it may enlighten you on the subject. Let's go back to Genesis 2. We'll pick it up at verses 7 and 8. All of these, all of these scriptures are in your notes. Um, so if you downloaded the notes, you'll see that. Um, if you need a copy of the notes, if you're here, I believe we have some. It says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. Okay, so, so far we see God forming the man from the dust of the ground. Now let's read on. Look at verses 15 through 24. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, from it, you will certainly die. The Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Verse, excuse me, verse 19. The Lord, now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused man, the man, to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed it up, closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. So to recap, he basically read the whole creation story in terms of God interacting and creating mankind. God had created the heavens and the earth before that. And then God created man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils. 
And later we see God um, saying that man needed a helper. Now, before I go any further, I want to state that this helper doesn't mean servant. <laughs> I know some of the men are like, hey, you're supposed to be helping me, you know. As if, they're the, as if our wives are our servants. Going back to the original language, that did not mean servant. It meant more of a companion or workmate, right? Parallel, even. <laughs> not lording it over. You get what I'm saying? So God created woman by doing what? By taking part of Adam's side, Adam's rib. We've, been, we've called it over, this, over the years, Adam's rib. We know that story. We don't know exactly what that means. Some scholars believe that God literally took part of the side. Some I've even read some scholars that believe that Adam originally had a womb. Uh, I don't know. That's kind of, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to spend any time on that. We don't know. There's a lot of things that we don't know about the creation story, a lot of things that we don't know about the state in the garden before the fall. We have to go by what the Word says. The Bible says that God took part of Adam's side and used that to form Eve. I believe it. So, so far, though, the point is, so far, what do we see? We see God in all of this, right? He created both the man and the woman. So, by the way, I'll throw off no extra charge for this little nugget. It occurred to me, maybe, you've, maybe it's occurred to you, that uh, the first man and woman didn't have belly buttons. I can't wait to see Adam and Eve in heaven. I'm gonna, the first thing I'm going to do is ask them to pull their shirt up. Let me see their, the, what's it look like to not have a belly button? Some of you are going to focus on that the rest of the service, and I just lost you. <laughs> what, did, what did the pastor preach about today? I don't know something about Adam and Eve not having belly buttons. That's all I got. It's all right. And so the man and the woman, they live together in the garden. But did you notice something? There is no mention of the woman's name. And there is no mention of her being a child bearer. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before. Up to this point, God himself had created both of them. And so the story goes. We know the story. I won't take time to go back and read. But chapter 3 is about, the chapter 3 of the book of Genesis is about the fall. We know that story. If you, have, if you don't know that story, go back and read it. There was a tree. I read about it. God said, don't take that fruit. If you do, you will surely die. The serpent showed up, tempted Eve. She got Adam involved. He blamed her. She blamed the serpent. They took the fruit. Sin entered the world. We know what the fall means. But notice one of the verses after the fall. In verse 20 of Genesis 3, it says, this is after the fall now. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. She's now given the name Eve. Did you know that she wasn't named Eve until after the fall? That's not something that you normally think about. And the significance of that is that the name Eve is an old Hebrew word, that, and, it's, and it's actually was in the old Hebrew, it's pronounced Hawa which is roughly translated as the source of life. And by the way, in chapter 4, if we were to keep on reading, in chapter 4, it begins with Adam and Eve coming together and conceiving a child. And sure enough, she, she, she bore a son named Cain, and then she bore another son named Abel, and on and on. And so it begins, right? So God created motherhood. But have you ever noticed the grace in the timing? See, in the garden, it was perfect. God created Adam and Eve himself with special attention. They walked and talked with God with no hang-ups, no sin, no shame, no death. And God provided for all that are needs, but sin entered the world, right? And all of that changed. Now there would be shame. Now there would be death. So, why did God create motherhood? Well, one of the answers I want to present to you, I'm going to present two answers to that question, because life must go on, right? Life must go on. We recently experienced uh, a grandson, and we went up to visit him in uh, Tacoma, Washington a few weeks ago. It was awesome. Can't believe he's already a month old. And... Um, 
it's funny because at work, that when I got back, somebody congratulated me and said something about it. And I said, I said that. Of all the things that I could dial up to say in response to that, I said, yeah, you know, life goes on, doesn't it? I'd never thought about it that way, but that, that phrase just rolled right off, my tongue, right off my tongue. Life does go on. See, God is still the giver of life. But now, new life would come through a woman's womb. And because of the penalty of sin, the childbirth would be painful. I started asking questions. Would, it, would there have been childbirth through a woman the way that we know it if there wasn't a fall? I don't know. We don't know. We'll never know that answer. But what we do know is that even though sin and therefore death entered the picture, God ordained it that life must go on. That's intentionality there, guys. See, think about it. If it wasn't about life going on, then God could have just as easily just pulled the plug. As soon as the sin entered the picture, it said, up, you're up. I'm, I'm done with you. Go off and do something else. But it wasn't his intention for, for human beings to be wiped out. He wanted life to go on. And by the way, even later, when the earth was destroyed because, through the flood because of sin, God provided a way out, didn't he? He, brought, he provided a way for humanity to continue through, in this case, it was Noah's family, right? Because life must go on. Okay, that's interesting. But this shows a characteristic about God that we have to understand. And that is this. God is a replenisher. Not just in the garden, not just after the fall, not just after the flood, but now, God is a replenisher now. That is his heart now for us, for you in your situation, for us in our struggle, for us after coming through a pandemic. Did you know that God wants to replenish? <laughs> There's a reason why the Bible is chock full of these notions. I will repay what the, the years that the locusts have eaten. A double portion for my people, declares the Lord. That's his notion is that God wants to replenish. This, this is a, a theme woven throughout the, the Bible, and the psalmist understood that in Psalm 42. It says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God, the psalmist says. And then later on in verse 5, it says, why, my soul, are you downcast why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. See, that is the way that God created us, that we will indeed experience dry and weary lands. We will indeed experience struggle in this world. And Adam and Eve did the unthinkable and allowed sin and did the very thing that God told them not to do and then blamed each other or blamed the serpent. I mean, that's, I love it how all the way back to the garden, as shame entered the picture, sort of the blame game, right? Even with all that going on, their eyes were open. They saw that they were naked. Can you imagine that? Before that, they didn't even understand the concept of being naked and being, being needed, uh, needing to cover up. But the Bible says that they were hiding after the sin. They were hiding from God, and he came to look for them in the cool of the morning because they had broken fellowship. Something had changed. Where are they? Every day that they, they, were, they walked and talked with the Lord. I can't imagine what that was like. And then all of a sudden, something, uh, there was a seismic shift. Something happened. And God was looking for them, and they were hiding. And he said, why were you hiding? And Adam said, because we were naked and afraid. Who told you you were naked? See, sin told them they were naked. Shame told them there's a reason to hide. Shame said you're no good. Shame says you're dirty. Shame says you're, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. See, none of that in, occurred to anybody until shame entered the picture. And now, years later, the psalmist understood 
that we were made for this fellowship. And as, as we're entering into a dry and a weary place, even if it's our own mistakes and our own choices like Adam and Eve, God wants to replenish. And God is the one that can replenish. Only he can replenish. There's nothing in this world that's going to satisfy. Trust me, I have tried. And every time I tried to look elsewhere, party, lifestyle, you name it, all the stuff that went with it and, and all the years of, I lost and the things that I lost in my, in my own personal life, the massive hemorrhaging of hurts that I still am trying to heal from years and years later from alcoholism. Nothing satisfies like God's living water. Only he can replenish. So indeed, as a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul, so my soul pants for you, my God. Because why? Because that's how you created me. You created me to thirst for you when I'm thirsty. Oh, I may look to other things, Lord. I, I may look to social media. I may look to people's approval. I may look to being cool. I may look to music. I may look to the culture and, and all that stuff, but it's going to leave me dry every time. And David said in Psalm 63, 1, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. That's just the way it is. And God is indeed a replenisher. Amen. I love this quote. C.S. Lewis said, Though our feelings come and go, God's love for us does not. Aren't you glad that God's not like we are? I say that phrase in my testimony that I give on Monday nights to celebrate recovery. I sure am glad that God doesn't rally around my opinion of myself. Aren't you? Aren't you glad God doesn't blame you? Aren't you glad that when we are dry and weary and we need something that, that, that we can go to God because he is a replenisher and he is not accusing us? He's not crossing his arms and going, oh, yeah, sure, you, now you need me. No, no, he is there. He wants to replenish. I just ask you today, are you in a dry and weary land? Are you facing something that is beyond you and bigger than you and it's just sucking the life out of you, guess what? I encourage you today to call out to him. Only he can replenish. If that's what his heart is, God is a replenisher. That is his heart for us. And isn't that what life is about when you think about it? Replenishing. Isn't that what's happening? I mean, I hate to break it down, but you know what? People die and people are born. It's a, it's a cycle. It's replenishing. You know, it's just like the garden, your garden. You know, the plants die. Guess what? You plant new ones or the seeds, they drop and they fall and they come up. You know, we got fires. We got major fires going on this, uh, recently in our valley. And by the way, they're talking about this year, being, this year being another dry season. I just dread it. Oh, Lord, I dread it. Please be, be careful out there, man. Don't play around with fire, please. Please. But you know what? The irony is, is that, you know, lightning, like that biggest, the, one of the biggest fires that struck up last year at Kings Canyon National Forest area, that was a lightning strike. Can't blame boneheads for out, you know, doing gender reveal parties with sparks and, and, and fireworks, you know, like that happened in L.A. last year. That was just a natural thing. That was lightning. And anybody that's ever, that knows anything about forestry knows that for thousands of years, forests burn. And guess what happens when they burn? They make way for new growth, and that's how it replenishes. In fact, the Indians, I found out that the Indians used to burn, do massive burns right, right up here by Bass Lake. They used to burn the whole thing down every, every 10 years or so and let it all come back up. They understood. Life is about replenishing. So congratulations, mothers. You are part of God's plan of replenishing. <laughs> Somebody's got to replace me when I'm gone. You see what I'm saying? There's intentionality in motherhood. Again, if it was just about, you know, popping out babies, anybody could have done it. God could have just done it himself. But there's intentionality in how he created this thing called motherhood. And that leads me to my next point. 
Why did God create motherhood? To show his nurturing nature. If we take a step back and look at the three persons of the Trinity, we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? The Father is the nurturer. If you look at their roles as laid out in the Word of God, the Son is the protector, purchased our salvation, fights for us, advocates for us, the right hand of the Father right now, advocating for you, advocating for me. The Holy Spirit is the encourager, the comforter. And each one of these play an important role in our livelihood as Christians. But I'm only going to talk about the Father's role today as a nurturer because when we look at him as a nurturer, we see his heart. Let's look at the very definition of, to, of nurturing. It means to feed and protect, to love, to encourage, to teach, support, as during the period of training and development, to hold closely. In other words, a mother. <laughs> right? You see what I'm saying? Is that, that's a perfect definition of what a mother is. I know to a certain extent. I mean, I'm a father. I, I, do, I do those things too but not like a mother does. God just ordained it to where he made mothers to be the nurturers to do what? Well, to nurture because life goes on, but also to reveal part of his character. He is a nurturer. And their scripture is full of examples of this attribute of God. Let's just look at a couple. In Psalm 147, 3, it says, he binds up the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Did you know God wants to do that in us? Can you see how he put that in a mother? <laughs> what, do, what, what do we want to do when we scrape our knees? We run to mommy, right? <laughs> you think that's accidental? That's not accidental. That's not because men are just being bozos and laying down on the job so the kids by default go to mom. It's God ordained it to be that way because the mother has that nurturing heart to reveal God's nurturing heart. Isaiah 25, 8 says, The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. Don't mommies do that too. <laughs> but I'm so glad the Lord wipes away the tears from my face. How about you? Isaiah 40, 11, it says, He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. So, guys, God is our creator, and he created us to need nurturing. Your need for nurturing is not by accident. God created you that way so that we would call out to him, and then he created this mother thing, this, this motherhood thing, so that this, this, so that this life cycle would keep on going and that the mother can reveal the heart of God in the very way that she acts naturally. I hope that mothers are encouraged by that today, that you are being who God created you to be. That's exactly how God created you to be. And as Christians, I want to know, who doesn't need to be nurtured by God? I'd like to meet you. Who doesn't need to be fed and protected and loved and encouraged and taught and supported, right? And held closely. Man, there are some times when I just, there's nothing I can do other than crawl into the arms of God. There are some times when life just gets heavy, and I don't know where you guys, I don't know how you guys cope. I used to run to the bottle. Let me tell you what, that always left me dry. It's funny how a liquid could leave you dry, but it did. And it killed everything. I lost everything that was precious to me. And I found out that all that was later on was an aching in my heart, and I was misidentifying it. I, I thought I needed that. I thought I needed this. I thought I needed to be cool. I thought I needed to do this and, and numb my mind. I thought I just, whatever. It's all we are misunderstanding and misinterpreting a, a God-given need to be nurtured. God created us to need him in that way. See, again, I say this, that God can do anything he wants. I believe that he could have done all the nurturing of us himself but he chose to create a mother role to provide the physical nurturing that a child needs. Why is that? Well, another reason is because God created us to be relational. God created us to be relational. He made us with a need for each other. 
No one is exempt. Oh, you may think you're exempt. I find that people that think they're exempt have so much hardness that they have yet to identify. That very anger and that very resolve that we have that says, I don't need anybody, is a cry because you desperately need somebody and you've been disappointed. And people have not been there for you, so you just kind of say, well, I'm not going to need anybody. Well, that, all that is is just compensating because we all have a need for community. That's why God says, and even in his word, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together. It's an isolation that we're deceived. An isolation breeds deception every time. Oh, I think I can just handle this on my own. Well, you're fooling yourself. God didn't create you to be that way. You're, if you think you can make it on your own, you're saying you're smarter than God is. Well, there's no exceptions. God made us to be relational. That's why there's this old saying that says, we are hurt in relationships and we heal in relationships. Have you ever noticed that to be true? So relational, let's talk about that for a moment. Relational is the opposite of isolation, isn't it? What does relational mean when you think about it? Doesn't it mean vulnerability? Doesn't it mean closeness? Doesn't it mean connection and even touch, right? Being touched and touching someone are fundamental modes of human interaction, <laughs> right? Right? In fact, the defini a definition of intimacy is to know someone and allow yourself to be known by that person. So when you look at that, from that standpoint, there is love and touch. There is comfort in touch. There is nurturing in touch. But there is more to that, especially in terms of what we are talking about today Scientists have discovered that in each of us, there is a hormone secreted by the pituitary gland called, here it is right here. Do anybody know what that is? <laughs> Any chemists in the, in, the, in the group? It's oxytocin. The God in his wisdom created this hormone in us. It's the hormone of love and attachment. It also has an anti-anxiety effect, by the way. And in women, this hormone helps with the birth process, bonding with the baby, and even in milk production. Isn't that a coincidence? What a strange coincidence that, look what evolution has done. Isn't that awesome? How did it know? God created us that way. God created the woman. That's part of the role of being nurturing. See, that's not accidental. It's exactly the way he created a woman and actually put these hormones in the woman that during the, the development of the baby inside, bonding with the baby, and even in the milk production, there's this oxytocin given off. How is it that a baby that is born, the moment that it comes out and breathes air, here's a stranger that you've never met before, but immediately, parents understand this, immediately there's a bond. You would take a bullet for that stranger that just came out. There's a bond there. Why? Because of the connection, that touch of the nine months and the talking outside the womb, right? <laughs> even in the, even, or even, you know, the, the voice, the voice recognition, it's just amazing how that works. In infancy, infancy the child enjoys a mother's and, and father's loving touch because it released, guess what, oxytocin into the body. And later, as an adult, we experience the effects of oxytocin when we enjoy good food, by the way, or a massage. Sandy, right? He was a masseuse. I, you know what I'm talking about. Physical touch with your spouse. Guess what's being released? Oxytocin. God made us that way. So again, God in his wisdom, he knew that if we humans can allow ourselves to be nurtured by our mother early in life and become comfortable with the idea that we do indeed need others, and ultimately we are more open to the idea that maybe, just maybe, we need to be nurtured by God. You ever thought about that? The mother's nurturing is preparing the way for us to reach out to God for nurturing. What a design. What an awesome design that is. Amen? Only God can do that. See, this explains why some 
that weren't nurtured early in life or maybe those that experienced loss of that nurturing during life through tragedy, maybe death or divorce or trauma, loss of life. Sometimes they have a harder time being vulnerable relationships later in life because that's been interrupted. See, if we are nurtured by our mothers early in life, we are more likely to allow ourselves to be nurtured by God. So mothers, today we honor you and we thank you for your nurturing. But guess what? You can't take all the credit. (laughs) God made you that way. Amen? Does that make sense? God made you that way and he made you that way intentionally. There's a much grander thing here going on. Life must go on. And also, God wants to reveal his own nurturing nature, right? I can understand that. I can understand that I have a God that that would do anything for me, that loves me unconditionally because I experienced the human version of that myself. A mom that I probably would do anything for me, right? Again, that's more than just mushiness. That's more than just something that we recognize once a year and buy some flowers and take them to lunch and and then get on with our lives. we got to understand that is part of his grand design of revealing himself to us. God made women that way intentionally. As I close, let me show you this. Oh, the old Proverbs 31 woman, right? Verses 28 through 31 of Proverbs 31 says, Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her hands, or excuse me, let her works bring her praise at the city gate. So indeed, mom, thanks for all you do. And we do see it today. We honor you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you, Lord, for the message. It's not just from others, Lord. It's for all of us today, God. That that's how you created the mom. That's how you created the mother. Because, yes, life must go on. And, yes, you loved us and you knew that we needed that nurturing. But, God, more than that, it's because you want to reveal to us your nurturing nature. We praise you for that, Lord. We thank you for that today. May we understand that as we celebrate our mothers today. And indeed, Father, I pray a blessing for each mother that is watching and listening today. Let's pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen.